Margaret Singer is very right when she says that uh, people are mistaken when they think that people that get up and involved in cultic Christianity or cultic churches are zombies. That is very far from the truth. I know I did not feel like a zombie at all. I thought, well, aside from them very being very strict and wanting to follow the Bible to the letter, which included no makeup, no jewelry, no fingernail polish, no, nothing um, they considered worldly, no worldly activities, all of these things I thought was them following the Bible. I didn't feel like a zombie at all. But she's very right about the idea that some of these people uh, in these groups were people that had their own minds. They were often very rebellious in other areas of their life or very unconventional in other areas of their life and wouldn't dream of not asking questions. But when it came to this, they seemed to give up their right to ask questions. They seemed to give up their right to ask questions probably like I did for the sake of the whole. So I bought the mentality that I don't, I don't want to destroy or hurt this entire group by asking questions that will confuse people. And this is, this is a tactic that is used a lot of times in these churches. Oh, you don't want to confuse everybody by asking too many questions. They treat people like children that they can't handle certain lines of thought. They can't process a, a person's question or where they're coming from. It's a very paternalistic type of mentality. So when you ask something that's too difficult for the pastor to answer, usually you will get well, sister, you need to be submissive. You just need to accept what the pastor is saying. Don't ask any more questions. You just need to accept. So it's really something when you think back on it, that maybe you were a person that did not accept that type of uh, shutdown. But because of your admiration for the group, then that caused you to act in a way that you would not have normally acted. It can be difficult to comprehend why and how individuals join extreme organizations. But as Dr. Singer explained in the previous clip, thought reform and brainwashing can affect anyone and are quite different from what is portrayed in Hollywood movies. Take Jason Van Tatenhove as an example. How did he become a member of the Oath Keepers from being a promising artist, government employee, and part-time writer? This right-wing militia group stormed the Capitol building on January 6 because of their fervent beliefs in the approaching federal government takeover of private citizens and their internment in concentration camps. Jason was a regular guy with ups and downs, things to overcome, and hopes and dreams. Early in life, he attended art school and even had his first solo museum show at the age of 24. His grandfather was a sculptor in the 1950s, and Van Tatenhove had grown up meeting cultural giants such as Andy Warhol. Jason owned a very successful tattoo shop in Colorado and lived a comfortable life after overcoming drug abuse and poverty issues. However, when his daughter from a past relationship turned 18, he felt free to chase new adventures and decided to move his current family to Butte, Montana. This was a move he thought would bring him closer to his father who lived there and it would start a new life for him in a place that he loved. However, neither of these goals came to fruition, and he asked himself, what do I do now? During this downtime in his life, he began to listen to Alex Jones, 
a far-right conspiracy theorist who is best known for claiming that the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting was a hoax. One day while listening to Jones's show, Jason heard a man named Stuart Rhodes, who had one patch over his eye from a wound he suffered when he accidentally shot himself in the face, talk about helping a cattle rancher named Cliven Bundy. This confrontation with federal agents is famously known as the Bundy Ranch standoff. Bundy owed the government over $1 million in fines and fees, and when he didn't pay them, they started confiscating his cattle. Armed militants were sent to the Bundy Ranch by Rhodes and the Oath Keepers to stop police from removing Rancher Bundy's cattle because they believed this was in line with their moral values. Jason wanted to accompany them, and he did so. He was captivated. He had a low opinion of government authority and thought that this standoff represented a brave and moral stand. He was in awe of these malicious members and their way of life. He wanted to be like his literary hero, Hunter S. Thompson, who traveled with the biker gang Hells Angels and authored a book, a well-known book by the same name. So he decided to accompany them to the standoff. Jason's goals were failing in his life, and he was without a job. All of this combined to influence Jason's heart toward willingly covering the Bundy story and ultimately leading him to spend a lot of his free time with the Oath Keepers. He told his wife, this could be my Hells Angels. What first began as merely a chance to write a book like Hunter Thompson turned to several years as a spokesperson for the Oath Keepers and testifying before Congress about the risk posed by this radical organization. He left after hearing prominent members publicly deny the Holocaust occurred as they grew more politicized and started to associate themselves with the Nazi party. So in our group, the Church of God, one of the things that they taught was that the Church of God was special. We were special in world history. We were special in the church world. There was nobody else like us that believed in the unity of God's people. And this was drilled into you.